All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Dumit. I'm a professor of anthropology and science and technology studies, as well as the director of the Institute for Social Sciences. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the latest installment of the ISS Noon Lecture Series. This series aims to spotlight the topical, cutting-edge social science research taking place on our campus by offering faculty members the opportunity to present their work to a broad interdisciplinary audience. The noon lectures are just one of many events hosted and supported by ISS. To stay up to date on these and other events, as well as on the latest social science news and funding opportunities, check out our website and subscribe to our newsletter, and you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to draw your attention to our spring conference, which is taking place next Friday, May 19th, at the Student Community Center. It's called Recomputing the Social Sciences. This event will gather scholars from across campus, the U.S., and the world to engage with, reflect on recent developments in computational approaches to social science research. I hope you'll join us. This afternoon, our speaker is Drew Halfman, Associate Professor of Sociology here at UC Davis. Dr. Halfman's research and teaching focuses on social movements and the politics of health and social policy. He's the author of Doctors and Demonstrators, How Political Institutions Shape Abortion Law in the United States, Britain, and Canada from the University of Chicago Press and winner of the 2013 Distinguished Scholarship Award from the Pacific Sociological Association. His work has appeared in the American Sociological Review, Social Problems, Health, Studies in American Political Development, and the Journal of Policy History. His current research is on the African-American struggle for health equality from Reconstruction to Obamacare. He's a member of the Scholars Strategy Network and co-director of its Bay Area Regional Network. As he presents his lecture entitled Reproductive Rights Under the Trump Administration, please join me in welcoming Drew Halfman. Right, so thanks, Joe and Vicki, for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. Um, what I'll try to do today, if I can do it all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the reproductive rights policies under the Trump administration so far and potentially. Uh, talking about a number of issues, and then I want to end with some discussion about the politics and potential politics of um, abortion and reproductive rights care uh, in the United States. All right, so um, that's enough said about that. Okay, so I want to start with uh, the Supreme Court. The most recent case um, in uh, abortion politics is Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstadt. Uh, this was, as has been the case with a lot of abortion decisions, it was the four liberal justices plus Justice Kennedy uh, that, that voted for this decision. Um, there have been requirements in Texas that um, abortion providers um, sort of fulfill the requirements of a mini hospital and also that their doctors um, get admitting privileges within a local hospital. These were things that were quite difficult for them to do. A lot of um, providers uh, actually closed in Texas. Uh, this decision was quite important. It struck down those restrictions, and importantly, it sort of um, gave a little bit of specificity to the undue burden standard that had been established in the Casey decision in 1992. Um, now the court needed to, to weigh the health benefits of restrictions against the degree of the burden on women who are seeking abortions, including the cumulative burden and sort of the additive burden of all of the regulations in a state, not just you know a single regulation. Um, in addition, in the past, um, the court had ruled that you know Congress could just say, oh, these things don't really affect women's access. Now the court was obligated to actually look at social science evidence on that issue rather than accepting the congressional assertions. Um, as you know, there was a recent Sup Supreme Court nomination, uh, Justice Gorsuch. Um, it's not completely clear how he might rule on abortion. Um, he calls himself an originalist. Most of his rulings have been narrow, technical. Um, he has a strong respect, respect for precedent. Um, it, most people who have tried to figure out his, abuse on, his views on abortion have looked at a book that he wrote about um, assisted suicide. Uh, there's a little bit of discussion of abortion in there, but again, it's not super conclusive. He, he accepts abortion as the law of the land, as an actual precedent. Um, he's not a big fan of some of, the, some of Kennedy's writing in that decision that sort of argues that we all have an opportunity to seek the life that we wish. 
uh, he's a little more skeptical about that. Um, it's not a huge change in the court since he's replacing Scalia, so the current balance on the court stays the same. The big change will come with the next pick, and um, that is rumored to be Justice Kennedy. Uh, there have been rumors that he may retire in June. He's going to be having a reunion with all of his clerks at that time, and it's not you know, the usual time for that reunion. Um, some people have suggested that Trump nominated Gorsuch in order to reassure Kennedy that the court was in good hands so that he could retire. Uh, Gorsuch was a clerk for uh, Justice Kennedy. Um, there's other justices which are getting quite old. Uh, other, other, well, liberal justices, Justice Ginsburg is 84, Justice Breyer is 78. Uh, you know, they are going to try and hang on, basically. I don't mean that's, I probably shouldn't say it like that. Um, uh, it's also possible, so you, as you recall, um, the Senate abolished the filibuster for the Gorsuch nomination because the Democrats had, in, had in, invoked the filibuster. That may allow Trump to choose a more ideological pick than he might have tried, than presidents might have tried to in the past because then they needed, you know, they needed at least some Democratic votes usually. That's no longer required, and so we could get a more ideological um, pick. Um, Trump has given out a list of, in, in partially to satisfy the Christian right, he gave out a list of who he would consider for the, for the Supreme Court. He has said that he will choose his next nominee from that list. Okay, is Roe going to go away? No, it's not, okay? And I wish people would stop saying that, okay? Um, it's really unlikely to ever be overturned overtly. Uh, it's an established precedent. It's been reaffirmed multiple times by the court. Roberts, Alito, and Gorsuch have all said that it's an established precedent. Um, the Casey decision in 92, the, the most recent decision, reinforced that precedent. Um, overturning it would be very bad for the court's institutional legitimacy. It would also be really bad politics for the Republicans. And imagine the mobilization on the part of American women if Republic, you know, if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe v. Wade. Not something the Republicans really want, and sad to say, Supreme Court justices are indeed partisan actors. Lots of research shows it. Uh, however, states and Congress can do a lot to restrict abortion without directly overturning Roe. And, you know, in my view, I think, you know, Talking about the overturn of Roe may mobilize people, but it also may eclipse some of the smaller changes that are happening. Uh, and so I, th I think those need to, uh, are important, essentially. On the issue of personnel, there are lots of anti-abortion officials within the administration. Mike Pence, uh, as you know, Kellyanne Conway was an advisor to the anti-abortion movement before she joined the administration. Jeff Sessions is an avid abortion opponent. Uh, an issue here is that the Justice Department will be charged with enforcing laws that restrict blockades of clinics um, and protect uh, clinics from violence. And so there's some question about his um, willingness to enforce those laws. Tom Price, an anti-abortion uh, activist, is uh, the head of HHS. He's recently, Pre President Trump has recently uh, appointed Teresa Manning, the former lobbyist for the National Right to Life Committee, as the head of population affairs, which runs the Title X program, the main federal family planning program. He's also hired Charmaine Yost, the former head of Americans United for Life, uh, to head public affairs at HHS. Uh, so there's a number of policy possibilities here. One is that the Affordable Care Act includes a mandate that employers um, cover all methods, all prescribed methods of contraceptive <coughs> care and without a copay. The HHS could, you know, get rid of that regulation without congressional legislation. Uh, there also have been um, proposals that um, the HHS should mandate parental involvement when it provides family uh, planning funds. Uh, and the HHS through the FDA is also responsible for the protocols that are used for uh, prescribing medication abortion. And so there could be some movement there as well. Um, you probably heard about the attacks on Planned Parenthood. Uh, parent, Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider, uh, pro providing approximately 30% of all abortions. Um, it, um, 
it gets about 40% of its funding from the federal government. Uh, the vast majority of that is for Medicaid. Um, there is no federal funding for abortion. Uh, however, there are 17 states, some of them under court order, who do provide funding for abortion, uh, Medicaid abortions, and they do that with their own money rather than using federal money. Um, and they make up uh, quite a large percentage of um, Medicaid recipients. About 48% of all Medicaid recipients are within those 17 states. Um, the most recent Republican health reform bill uh, cuts funding to Planned Parenthood for, for one year. Um, we'll see whether that um, stays in the Senate bill. And then lastly, there was some recent legislation I won't talk, well, I, I guess I will talk about a little bit. Um, it um, allows states to withhold uh, Title X funds, family planning funds from, um, from Planned Parenthood. Um, it passed with, well, it only had 50 votes, 50 Republican votes. So uh, Vice President Pence had to come and cast the final vote, the 51st vote. Uh, two Republicans, uh, Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski voted no. Um, normally in the Senate these days, you need 60 votes to pass stuff. Uh, this bill, uh, because it was a review of a presidential regulation that had occurred within 60 days, only needed 51 votes. Okay, uh, and this will be relevant when we talk about uh, health care reform. Okay, the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act was a tremendous, um, you know, a tremendous um, step forward for reproductive rights and contraceptive care in particular. Um, there was a Medicaid expansion that massively increased the number of people in Medicaid. Uh, 19 states refused to do it, um, but 16 Republican governors, and most of those states that refused were Republican, but 16 Republican governors did indeed expand Medicaid. Uh, it also provided income-based subsidies to help people buy health care. It required individuals and some employers to provide health insurance. It also provided a bunch of new funding for prevention uh, and also for community health center, uh, centers. And um, it's had a tremendous effect. So the non-elderly uninsurance rate has fallen from 16.6% to approximately 10%. So really a huge increase in coverage. Uh, in terms of reproductive health, um, Medicaid currently pays for 50% of all births in the United States, which is enormous. And so this expansion of Medicaid has an important impact. Uh, Medicaid also provides 70% 5% of all public spending for family planning. Um, and as I said, this, uh, the states that do cover Medicaid abortions cover 48% of Medicaid recipients. So uh, the, even though the Affordable Care Act was not covering abortions, the fact that it was expanding Medicaid expanded the number of abortions that were being covered in the states that expanded uh, Medicaid. Uh, it also required that insurers cover maternity care under essential health benefits. Um, it required that all prescription contraceptives had to be covered without copays. And I'll skip what it said about abortion in the interest of time. This is the new bill from the Republicans, the American Health Care Act. It rolls back quite a few of the provisions of the ACA. It redistributes money from the sick and the poor to the well and middle class and upper class. It, the easiest way to understand it is as a very large cut to Medicaid in order to pay for tax cuts for the rich. Um, so it does a few things. First of all, it block grants Medicaid, which will over the long term reduce Medicaid spending. Uh, it eliminates the federal funds that had been provided to the states in order to expand Medicaid. Um, the, it establishes tax credits to help people buy health insurance, but unlike the ACA, it bases them on your age rather than on your income, okay? So if you are a poorer person, you're, you're, and especially if you're younger, you're not gonna get nearly as much to help you buy health insurance. It eliminates the individual employer mandates to, to buy and provide health insurance. Um, it also allows states to eliminate some protections for pre-existing conditions if you don't maintain continuous coverage. All that funding for prevention and community health, much of it is gone. Um, the CBO predicts that the non-elderly uninsurance rate would increase from its current rate of 10% to 
to 19% by 2026. So basically all the gains in coverage of Obamacare would be gone. In terms of reproductive health, um, it would allow states to opt out of the essential benefits requirements. So this could include maternity care. Uh, before the ACA, only 11 states mandated maternity care. Uh, it also eliminates Medicaid funding for Planned Parenthood for one year. Um, it prohibits the use of federal subsidies to buy plans that cover abortion. So all of those tax credits that would be provided, you could not spend them on abortion. Um, so, you know, most insurers would not even offer plans that covered abortion. Um, it also um, potentially could eliminate the contraceptive mandate. It doesn't do that at this point, but that's something that the HHS could do. I want to talk about the state regulations. Um, this is the number of enactments by the states in each year. Um, you can see that um, since about 2010, there's been a real spike in those enactments. Um, from 73 to 2010, the, the, the sort of most consequential of those enactments involved mandating parental involvement, um, waiting periods when people wanted to get abortions, and requirements of mandatory counseling. Uh, from 2010 to 2016, there was sort of a movement in what was called um, trap laws, targeted regulation of abortion providers. Um, there also was a lot of action in terms of, uh, states were allowed to um, exclude abortion from their health exchanges, and so a lot of states did that, so that was also part of the increase in regulation. Uh, in, this, in the first quarter of 2017, already 431 bills have been introduced. Um, people have argued that the election of Trump has in, emboldened the anti-abortion movement. And the types of things that are being proposed is one is a ban on abortions after 20 weeks post-fertilization. Another is a ban on a method of abortion, dilation and evacuation. Um, this is, uh, so 11% of all abortions occur after the first trimester, and this method is used in about 95% of those abortions. So it's really the main method for later abortions. Um, there are also a variety of restrictions on fetal tissue donation and research, you know, responding to the Planned Parenthood controversy, bans on abortions for sex selection and genetic anomaly. Uh, and a variety of new uh, restrictions that require that fetal tissue be cremated or buried, sometimes with an actual funeral. Um, there's been a decline in providers in recent years. There are currently 788 clinics. Um, between 2011 and 2014, this was a 6% drop. A number of states have only a single provider, and Kentucky apparently is in danger of losing that provider, so they would be the only state with no provider at all. Uh, there was a lot of attention in Texas to um, these restrictions on the clinics, and a lot of clinics closed. Uh, there are 28 remaining, but only three of the 20 that closed have reopened. Uh, another factor that I haven't read about in the press that much is that the abortion rate has declined quite severely, and a lot of it has to do with um, increased use of long-acting contraceptives, such as the IUD, such as um, implants. and. Um, that's putting pressure on clinics too. Uh, they have to provide a certain number of abortions to break even, and so the decline in the abortion rate is, is causing an issue. And so, you know, I mean, on the one hand, that might mean that the declining in, decline in providers is not reducing, um, is not causing a problem for capacity, essentially, but it does cause a huge problem for the geographic distribution of abortion clinics. Um, and mainly that's because, you know, 95% of abortions are provided in standalone clinics rather than in hospitals or doctors' practices, et cetera. And so you get these just tremendous clustering of the geographic distribution of abortion provision. Uh, this is a picture about that. So this is the distance that people need. Oh, that, is, that picture is not showing up real well. Uh, the distance that people need to drive to get to the nearest abortion clinic. So the very dark is a drive of 200 miles. And you can see there's this line right down the center of the map uh, where people have to drive very long distances to access abortions. Um, so yeah, the darker. So we have a you know, sort of middle of the country phenomenon in, in terms of uh, geographic distribution. And, you know, and a lot of these are also very rural states as well. 
All right, so I want to talk in the remaining time about the politics of this all. Um, Trump, during the election, it wasn't really clear what he was all about, uh, but he has clearly decided that he wants to pay back the Christian right for sticking with him during the election. Uh, they were against him during the primaries. Uh, he released a, or wrote a letter to them in which he said that he would have four priorities. Uh, they took this to heart anti-abortion justices for the Supreme Court, a national 20-week ban on abortion, eliminating funding for Planned Parenthood, and making the Hyde Amendment permanent. Uh, that's the amendment that uh, it has to be approved with each annual appropriation, but it restricts abortion funding by the federal government. And they'd like to make it permanent through legislation. Um, so this bill that just passed, the AHCA, um, I do not like that bill. Uh, I'm pleased to say that there are quite a few sticking points for that bill within the Senate, like quite a few. Um, and here are a few of them. So one of it is that it, you know, it's, it significantly reduces the Medicaid expansion, eliminates the Medicaid expansion. In fact, there are 20 Republican senators who are from states that expanded Medicaid. Okay, Many of those senators want to maintain that. And then just as an aside, um, the Republicans are going to try and pass this through a process called reconciliation, which will only require them to have 51 votes. Well, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have Vice President Pence as the tiebreaker, so really they only need 50 votes. But they only have 52 people, and the Democrats are not going to play. So that means they, you know, they can only afford to lose two senators, okay? which puts them in a very difficult position. Um, so all those senators that want to expand Medicaid, they're going to have to deal with them. Uh, a second thing is that um, these new tax credits will vary by age, but they won't vary by income. They also won't vary by place. And rural states have much higher health care costs than other states. And so this is going to create some geographic issues for the Senate. Um, there's also some reduced protections for pre-existing conditions, which I expect to cause a problem. Defunding Planned Parenthood may also be a problem. There are already two senators, Rep. Uh, Senator Collins and Murkowski, who have put, put a line in the sand. They will not accept the defunding of Planned Parenthood. So that reduces the margin. I mean, suddenly the Republicans have no margin at all if they want to leave that in there. There are also a number of senators who've also suggested that they might have issues with that um, proposal. And then lastly, there is these issues about reconciliation. Reconciliation was a process that was established to allow Congress to reduce the deficit without having to deal with the filibuster. And as a result, you can only use that process if your um, legislation has budgetary effects. And any um, parts of the legislation that only have incidental budgetary effects are not allowed. And the Senate parliamentarian will make the decisions about what is and what isn't allowed. Uh, so there's a few things in the bill already that probably won't pass muster with the parliamentarian. Uh, so one is this provision that states can opt out of essential health benefits, including maternity care. Uh, other things might be mental health care or substance abuse care, things like that. Um, the stuff about them charging higher premiums for pre-existing conditions may also be a problem. And then lastly, they've included a penalty for um, lapsed coverage of 30%. That, that may also be an issue. So, you know, and the Senate has said that they're basically going to start from scratch. First they said they were going to start from scratch. Now they're starting to say, oh, no, we'll incorporate part of, you know, the House bill. But um, probably not. Many elements will have to be re uh, reviewed. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the sort of more long-term politics of abortion. Uh, so, you know, the parties have moved apart in many ways, including on abortion. Uh, this picture shows it's a, it's a scale of liberalism versus conservatism, and it shows uh, where the parties stood over time. And you can see that since the 70s, this middle one is the, de the Democrats as a whole, uh, there's been a real, or even I guess I'll say the 70s, early 80s, there's been this real divergence between the parties. You should note that it's mainly the Republicans who have gotten much more conservative, although Democrats have gotten slightly more liberal as well. Um, this party polarization has made it very difficult uh, to find any sort, well, 
it's really launched a huge anti-abortion campaign by the Republican Party. But an important point to make here is that it's not about public opinion, okay? So um, the only people who've really diverged are people who actually identify with the party, who call themselves Republicans, uh, including the activists and leaders within the party. Um, public opinion on abortion has been largely stable since Roe v. Wade. So it's not an issue where Americans are getting more anti-abortion. If anything, they're getting less anti-abortion, though again, the polling is sometimes a little different, difficult to, um, to uh, credit, I would say. Um, majority of Americans believe that early abortions should be legal, uh, but many of them uh, support some sort of restrictions on later abortions. Moreover, you know, polling people about abortion is not so accurate because they have very mixed, confused, ambivalent feelings about abortion that typically aren't, you know, it's not something that can really be reflected in a poll question. And then lastly, very few people vote on their abortion preferences. They're much more likely to vote on, you know, the state of the economy, other larger issues. Abortion is often a very low salience issue for voters. So the point, again, I want to make here is that the key issue is that the Republican Party became an anti-abortion party, and especially its hardest core members. Okay? It's not that public opinion has been changing, and thus the parties have followed. So given that um, you know, abortion rights are going to be most uh, secure when the Democrats are in power, um, so that leaves sort of two options for abortion rights supporters. One is to elect more Democrats. A second is to try and reduce the degree to which the two parties are crazy about the abortion issue. And Mark Graber makes this argument that because most educated people and legal elites in particular support abortion rights, if, if we just do this thought experiment, if abortion were not a partisan issue, it would probably be fairly well protected by the Supreme Court and the judiciary, okay? Because the only reason we currently have anti-abortion justices is because a anti-abortion president appointed them, okay? So the notion is, if we could go back to some time earlier in our history when it wasn't a partisan issue, this, we could rely on the judiciary to take care of things, okay? Um, so I'm gonna make a little bit of an argument for trying to departisanize de this a little bit, but you could easily say, no way, that's never gonna happen. Uh, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube after it's already been out, okay? But I do wanna talk about some trends that might um, be relevant. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide, except to say that it's been said that the Democrats will soon have an advantage in presidential elections because of the way that the electorate is changing. I guess there had been some hope that that would work for Hillary this time. It didn't, in case you didn't hear. Um, and so that's an issue. And then the other issue is that uh, the Republicans really have an advantage in the House of Representatives and in the states in terms of the maldistribution of liberal voters who are concentrated in the cities. Um, also an issue is that Democrats don't tend to really vote in the midterms in the way that they do during presidential elections. And so this has been a time when Republicans have made huge gains. Um, they, after 2010 and 2014, they had the full control of the state legislature in 22 states. The Democrats had that in eight states. So quite a large difference. Um, in 2018, it seems likely that the Democrats are going to do better because of Trump and also because the, uh, the new uh, Affordable Care Act, the repeal legislation is extremely unpopular. Uh, but they can't win back the Senate because this, the Democrats are defending too many seats in the Senate. Uh, an important moment is going to be 2020, the presidential year. Um, Democrats will vote in higher numbers at that year. It's also when redistricting will occur. So if Democrats do well then, they'll have an opportunity to gerrymander, to rewrite legislative districts to their advantage in a way that the Republicans were able to do, to do in 2010. Okay, so then about reducing polarization, okay? So let's say the abortion rights movement wanted to do this, which I'm not certain that they do. Uh, so one way to do this would be to increase the support for pro-choice Republicans. 
uh, realizing that those pro-choice Republicans would never form a majority in, in the party. Uh, another issue is that the number of evangelicals in the United States is declining. Uh, so it could be that evangelicals' influence is, is falling. And in fact, the fact that Trump was able to win the primaries without the support of evangelicals is a testament to their declining influence, though you know, clearly they were useful in the general election. There's also this issue, and that is that young evangelicals are far less conservative than their parents, especially on issues of same-sex marriage, climate change, poverty, etc. And so it's possible that they could be lured into the Democratic Party. However, they remain anti-abortion. Okay, so you know that would be a compromise or a decision that the Democratic Party would have to make. Lately, there's been this big dispute within the party. Uh, Bernie Sanders and Tom Perez, the chair of the DNC, uh, supported an anti-choice candidate for the mayor of Omaha, and there was a huge outcry. People felt that abortion is non-negotiable within the Democratic Party, and so that Sanders and Perez uh, should not support this candidate. After that, Perez sort of backed down and he blamed it on Sanders. Okay. Um, another possibility here would be a number of broader measures that would reduce party polarization in general. I'm not going to go into all of them. Uh, one is to have a holiday for elections uh, because currently, you know, low levels of voter turnout increase polarization since the most hardcore voters go to the polls. Um, changing the way uh, we handle campaign finance could matter. Um, this one is a one I like, but it's never going to happen, but I'll just tell you about it anyway. Um, it would be to change House terms to four years and to change Senate terms to eight years. And what that would mean, there's no, there would no longer be midterm elections. Okay? All elections would happen in a presidential year. And so the notion is there'd be much higher levels of turnout in all elections which would advantage the Democrats, which might explain why it's never going to happen. Okay. All right. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the medicalization of abortion. Oh, I don't have quite, well, I'll do, I'll do my best. Um, so in my book, um, I compared the degree of medicalization of abortion in Britain and the United States. And in the British case, um, Doctors there were very, it was very important to them that they be able to diagnose the necessity of abortion. Okay, so for mental health reasons, physical health reasons, um, sometimes for socioeconomic reasons, but it was always diagnosed in terms of health. Okay, as a result, uh, abortion became framed as a health right in Britain. Uh, the National Health Service funded the vast majority of abortions since they were, you know, medically required, medically indicated. Um, and also doctors fought pretty hard against the anti-abortion movement when it tried to, tried to restrict abortion. They felt it was their domain, the anti-abortion movement shouldn't get involved. Okay, Compare that to the United States. Uh, doctors for much of abortion history since the 70s have not been particularly good allies for the uh, abortion rights movement. Um, the vast majority of OBGYNs have never done an abortion and never will. Instead, most abortions are provided in single purpose clinics by abortion specialists. Okay? Medicine has washed its hands in many ways of the abortion issue. Okay? Um, now, I argue in the book that part of this is because medicine was more concerned at that time with protecting you know, a, a private system of medicine that was very lucrative for them. Uh, initially, they wanted to do some sort of medical necessity reform, just like the doctors in Britain, but eventually they backed off it after feminists argued for abortion on demand. They were like, oh, we don't really like that, but we don't really care that much about it. We rather fight national health insurance, which indeed was an issue for them at that moment. As a result, abortion gets defined as a right of privacy rather than as a health right. Uh, many abortions are defined as elective, okay, rather than something that's medically required. And I should add here that, um, you know, this whole idea of doctors diagnosing abortions is quite objectionable on feminist grounds, right? Um, one thing I'll say about it is that over time, the degree to which doctors acted as gatekeepers broadened such that now in Britain, 
pretty much all abortions are approved, but there still is the requirement that they be approved, and by two doctors as well, which was offensive, you know, to many people, including myself. Okay. Um, so, so the notion here, though, is that medicine can be a pretty strong defender of abortion rights if it can be brought into the issue. And so there have been some attempts by the abortion rights movement to do that, okay? So in the 90s, uh, a lot of new reproductive rights organizations uh, arose among medical providers, among physicians, medical and nursing students, various clinical and social science researchers and med schools. Uh, there were new initiatives to train more doctors to do abortions. Uh, the notion is to try and get you know, try and get some of the abortions out of these clinics, which are quite vulnerable to attack, and into a variety of pri providers, medical groups, hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, there was also a move by a variety of the professional organizations, especially the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, to devote, devote more resources to defending abortion rights. So really a, a, a sort of increased medicalization or medical alliances uh, for abortion. Uh, I want to just suggest a few other strategies as I close. Uh, so one is to train more doctors in medication abortion. Currently, um, the vast majority of doctors who provide medication abortion also have been trained to provide surgical abortion and also provide surgical abortions. The dream of medication abortion is that it would make it possible for lots of doctors to provide those types of abortions, but that has not been the case. Only abortion specialists are providing them, and part of it is a training issue. A second issue is that most hospitals, including non-sectarian ones, you know, like Kaiser, outsource their abortion provision for a few reasons. One is it's cheaper because they're sending it to a specialist. Second, you know, they can avoid any sort of anti-abortion protest within their hospital. And also they can deal, that doesn't mean that they don't have to deal with conflicts within the hospital between pro-choice and anti-choice staff members, okay? Um, so recently there was a movement at Kaiser by physicians within Kaiser to try and bring abortions back in house and they succeeded. And so it might be possible to train other doctors to mount similar campaigns within their hospitals. Um, hospital, uh, social movement research has shown that hospitals are more vulnerable if they're a nonprofit because they have sort of obligations that they need to live up to. It's easier for you to sort of discredit them publicly. Hospitals are also more uh, vulnerable when they're in financial distress, okay? So these would be the types of hospitals that one might uh, focus on. Uh, there's also this issue, there's a program at UCSF called the Ryan Program. Uh, what it's done is it helps medical centers to set up training uh, in abortion and family planning in general. And usually this involves funding to establish a clinic. Okay, so an increased uh, establishment of uh, abortion clinics within uh, medical centers. And then lastly, you know, a lot of medical groups, a lot of hospitals won't deal with abortion. And one way that might reduce that would be, to, sure, be to, sh uh, to be sure that more women were in positions of leadership within those various organizations, medical groups, hospitals, professional organizations, et cetera. Uh, women OBGYNs are more likely to provide abortions than our male OBGYNs. So this might be a way to try and address this issue as well. So, you know, a lot of this stuff is long-term type of stuff, um, but the Trump administration will not last forever. Um, there is a post-Trump era, and, um, and some of this stuff, in fact, doesn't require, you know, I mean, especially the stuff about the gender gap, it's not about abortion at all, at least on its face, right? And so these are types of initiatives that I think could help change the long-term picture, but aren't about abortion rights uh, directly. So uh, thanks very much. Thank Any questions? questions? Yes. Well, I, just some anecdotal information. My mother belongs to various uh, prayer groups, and she told me that every single one of them, the, the other participants said, it would be a mortal sin to vote for a candidate in the presidential election who supported abortions. 
she couldn't talk to these people. About these are Catholics, it. I take it. These are Catholics, yeah. and so I think they, it seemed to her that these folks were voting on that one issue. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, um, certainly that's true. If you look at um, Catholics' support for abortion, they actually have very similar attitudes towards uh, than the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. But again, they're not in a church group these Catholics, right? Mm -hmm. So there's lots of Catholics who are Catholics, but they're not, more you know, intense. so, you know, as you become a more intense, more active Catholic or evangelical for that matter, your abortion attitudes tend to be closer to those of the leadership, right? But Catholics in general are, are quite willing to, and even, and many evangelicals as well, are quite willing to vote for a abortion, you know, a abortion rights candidate, essentially. Erin? Can you talk a little bit more about medication abortion, like what the training issues are, what um, I mean, I understand the politic, political problems of providing medication abortions in the place of Kaiser, but what are the medical, logistical training issues that they could use to argue against? Yeah, so um, I've been talking to this woman, Bimla Schwartz, who's here at um, UC, uh, Davis Medical Center, and, um, you know, she argues that it's really very easy to do, and basically an online training would be enough. Uh, to train people to do this. There are some barriers in the law, though, and this is that um, when the FDA approved uh, the abortion pill, um, they do not allow doctors to prescribe it and then you pick it up at a pharmacy. Instead, the doctor must give the pill themselves, okay? And this means that the doctors have to have it on hand, okay? Uh, moreover, they have to be part of a registry that the federal government holds of people who are authorized to provide this. So this is quite a barrier, something that I don't expect. To, you know, I was thinking about this when Hillary got elected. This might be something to work on. Clearly, that's not going to happen over the next <laughs> four years. Um, you notice I say four. But to change that. Uh, to change that. Yeah. Cool. If we could change, you know, if, uh, if you could change those sort of protocols, that might allow more doctors to, and then also build these sort of online, um, these sort of online tools, it might allow more doctors to provide it. Um, there's also a little bit of a conflict within the abortion community. Um, one, go the goal of some is to sort of upgrade the skills of abortion providers put them in academic medicine so that they're not as stigmatized, okay, sort of to give abortion provision more status, right? On the other hand, um, some people argue that you should broaden the number of people who can provide abortions. Uh, there was a bill in California to allow nurse practitioners to do it. Uh, there's also, um, you know, BIMLA believes that sort of um, internists and family practice um, doctors should be trained, et cetera. And so there's, there's sort of a you know, the people who are for this upgrading, they tend to believe that the family practice people will never do it and it's a waste of time to focus on them, et cetera. So there's a little bit of a conflict there in terms of how one might medical, you know, medicalize abortion. And the abortion pill is like first trimester. That's right. Um, this doesn't seem like that big of a barrier. I hear you. <laughs> well, I mean, Bimla tells me that, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, the training that you'll get about it will be like in the pharmacological section of your training, but usually it's just like mentioned as an aside, and there's no real discussion. It's like, hey, this is easy, right? Instead, people believe that they need to be able to do surgical abortions to provide this. I mean, I would say this would be the biggest barrier. Uh, there's a notion that only surgical providers do this. And, you know, if you don't want to go through that sort of training, which is quite involved and intensive, then, then you're not going to do it. Yes. Can you back on that? I read about how um, there's organizations that provide the, the forest pills to people in countries where it's illegal. Would you expect to see that in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, that's been happening in the U.S. Um, uh, some states have ended up prosecuting women who do that, um, but it has been happening in the United States. Um, moreover, in much of the underdeveloped world, um, the morning after pill can be used for abortions in, in the right concentration. And, um, you know, that's something I also talked about with Bimla in the pre-Trump era uh, about, you know, could that news be spread more broadly, et cetera, et cetera. But it's slightly, very slightly more risky than uh, using a combination of drugs that's used in the, you know, mifepristone, which is used in the, the, the current regime. Uh, but that, you know, that, um, so there's a, something that's, 
you know, available without prescription everywhere that actually could be used to uh, provide Medicaid abort. I'm sorry, uh, medication abortions. David. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts on Pope Francis and recent changes? Say, given that looking at all these possible routes, uh, I guess last year I just looked it up to I, I remembered something about it. it's now possible for a priest to absolve abortion. That's right. And so while technically you're still automatically excommunicated, if you kind of run and confess your sins, then you're okay. Oh, yeah, this is my mother. She's in that. So I've been watching this process. Uh, same thing, always votes because of the abortion issue. Yeah. But the Pope Francis situation. That's not your mother. What's that? <laughs> I, I know what you're <laughs> No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an impossible uh, uh, on all sor sorts of levels. Uh, uh, but it's been interesting watching the Pope Francis uh, evolution or, or sure. transformation. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, I mean, it's in a way, it's something that's been happening in the Catholic Church for a long time. You know, the Catholic Church has sort of these liberal and conservative wings. And there was a period in the 80s when the more liberal Catholics started to say, yes, we're pro-life, but we need to think about pro-life as a seamless garment, okay, that involves not only opposition to abortion, but also opposition to the death penalty, opposition to a lot of war, opposition to nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And so... You know, it was a notion of being anti-abortion as Pope Francis remains, but taking a sort of, you know, making it less of a top priority, relaxed. essentially. A little, yeah, a little bit it's relaxed. It's a little different, though. It's well, this thing in, in terms of um, not, you know, not making it a mortal sin, it's actually, yeah. well, it isn't, well, mortal sins can also be confessed, so not an excommunicable offense, essentially. Yeah. Yes. And since that, it seems like anti-abortion groups have started to use that as an argument to defund Planned Parenthood, say, because they say that you can take that money and put it towards the FQ FQHCs. I was wondering what your thoughts on that were. Well, it's kind of ironic, because they actually strip a lot of that funding in the current bill, mm -hmm. so they won't have that argument anymore. Totally. Though, you know, they don't need, they have no trouble finding arguments. And then also, in, I've seen at the local level, um, local women's health clinics that provide abortions have started closing in part because they're competing with FQHCs and they get a higher reimbursement rate through Medicaid and Medi-Cal. Uh -huh. Like a weird irony of Obamacare in a sense. Really interesting. I had not heard about that. Or like they, they see themselves as in competition, not in a necessarily bad, like it's bad because they're closing, but they definitely see themselves as allies because FQHCs often actually refer out to um, independent women. I see. Okay. But it's causing a problem for their survival. Yeah. Interesting. I was thinking that, like, well, maybe a decline in the abortion rate is leading to clinic closures. That also could it could be also be that. Liberal states like California. Interesting. With still such a proliferation of these um, community health centers that don't necessarily provide abortions and that do have to provide comprehensive health services, not just family planning services. Got it. You know, but they provide a bunch of services that would help cross subsidize abortion in, say, a, in sort of Planned Parenthood or something like that. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. So, on um, one of the slides that you you mentioned that one of the restrictions that they're trying to or intending to place would be on people choosing around the sex, the g the gender, and then also on genetic anomalies. Yes. So, is, are those restrictions like without regard to whatever trimester it would be? Um, so, you know, because one thing you hear about a lot of women who are making a choice after the first trimester, it's because they, particularly around genetic anomalies, find out something absolutely devastating about that, about the fetus, that it will never survive, or furthermore, that it's, a, you know, a danger to them or whatever. And so, is, is there a time restriction on the genetic anomaly piece? It is, is, is that what you mean, that like, you just couldn't make that decision at all based on genetic anomaly? That's right. And so, you know, many, some of those, um, so some of those restrictions will have sort of a, a health of the mother uh, exemption or something, but most won't, or some won't, I would say. But no, I have not seen them sort of restricted just to late abortions. It's sort of all abortions, essentially. 
But I mean, there is this problem you're mentioning, like in states that don't have that law, this is the, you know, many states will have sort of a restriction on how late one can have an abortion. Mm -hmm. And so when people find out late, sometimes it pushes them over the limit. Right. Bill? Just, what's the status of, of a baby being born with a genetic anomaly? Does that count as a pre-existing condition? I'm just wondering how all these things feed into each other. It's a good question. Um, I'm guessing that, so what the, the current house bill does is that um, the insurers can all only exclude you in that fashion or charge you more if you did not maintain continuous coverage, okay? A baby clearly can't <laughs> be faulted for not having continuous coverage, right? So my guess on this is that, you know, babies could indeed be covered. Uh, that insurers based because there's still guaranteed issue on the part of insurers okay so the insurers would still have to accept that baby mm -hmm. and would not be required I'm mean, sorry and could not charge that baby more because the baby had maintained continuous coverage does that make sense yeah yeah, yeah. I'm just it just does this go to the Jimmy Kimmel issue no <laughs> no I guess not I mean no I was just thinking about the ways in which all of these policies or laws start increasing the number of high cost care while reducing the amount of coverage for that so sure um, yeah i mean with mental health with a lot of things mm -hmm. um you know i mean with the contraceptive mandate as well yeah. i mean that's gonna inc you know when you have more un unintended pregnancies there are tremendous cost to that on a variety of levels right Thank you all. Thanks a lot.